I'm Professor Larson. I teach in the philosophy department. I'm the co-director of the Great Books program on campus, and I also teach in Conversatio. And my micro lecture today is on contemplation. What I hope to do is help you better understand what contemplation is and give you a few everyday examples of uh, people engaging in, conver in contemplation. To start, let's remember the distinction that you've been introduced to between servile arts and leisurely arts. Servile activities are activities that are valuable because they're productive. They are useful activities. Think of building a bridge. We like people who build bridges. There's a lot of labor, a lot of thought get, that goes into it. But it's an activity that is ordered towards a product. And so all of the activity has its value because in the end we have a bridge that we value. So the activity itself is not an end or a goal. It has a goal outside of itself. That's why it's called a servile activity. It's an activity that serves an end or a goal. Sometimes this activity is called drudgery. Uh, that's because these activities, if we could skip them, we very often times would. If we could just have that bridge and we wouldn't have to do all the labor to make it, bring it into being, we would do that. Or a better example is probably uh, things like washing the dishes, or cleaning a bathroom, or your room, or fixing uh, broken or leaking pipes. We need to do those activities, but boy, it'd be nice if we didn't have to. If they just would take care of themselves. So, servile activities are activities that have an end outside of themselves. We generally wouldn't choose to do them. Very often they are pressing activities. Activities we have to do and we don't have a choice about it. So, for example, providing food for ourselves. We don't have a choice about that. We're forced to do that. Nature forces us to do that. Emergency medical care. If I break my leg or if I'm having a heart attack, we need to have that taken care of. And so doctors and medical, uh, medical professionals do things to me. That's actually servile activity because it's an activity that has a goal. It's to make me healthy again. And we also know it's servile and somewhat drudgery because we demand to be paid for it. <laughs> it we, we wouldn't otherwise choose to do it, but because we get paid, we're happy. So, our life is filled with servile activities. But there's another kind of activity. Besides servile activities, there are leisurely activities. Leisure does not mean just sacking out and sleeping or laying on the beach. It doesn't mean inactivity. Leisure in the tradition that we're talking about is a kind of activity. There are things that we do because we, because we want to do them. They're, we enjoy doing the activity. Um, not because we have to, uh, but because we can. And some people say that we work so that we can do the things of leisure. Lots of examples of this. One is playing sports. Think of all the students on campus in intramural or varsity sports. Or just a pickup game of frisbee or baseball. That's a leisurely activity. You're doing something, but not because you have to. Simply because you enjoy doing it. If you enjoy listening to music or playing music. If you enjoy watching sports on television or going to the movies. You're not doing a lot, but you're doing something. You're paying attention and you're watching and you're enjoying that. You can also think of spending time with your family as an activity, your family or your friends. That's a leisurely activity where you're sharing your stories, what you do this week, and you share the, the stories of your week. I think that people who go hunting, people who go hiking, people who like being in the outdoors, um, they do that not because they have to, but because they enjoy it. All of these are uh, leisurely activities. Uh, art and cooking as well, when you want to make a beautiful meal. Uh, that can be a leisurely activity. So, what's contemplation? 
Well, first thing is to note is that contemplation is a leisurely activity. Um, this surprises students. Uh, usually, at, when I ask them what they think contemplation is, they guess that it's thinking, and they guess that it's thinking about something important. Um, but then they say things like, it's thinking really hard. And I say, okay, and about what? And they answer, um, a tough decision that you have to make, figuring out the pros and cons. Examples that they give are um, deciding what you're going to major in, deciding which school is the best one for you. In that case, what they're really describing is an activity that the tradition is called deliberation. And deliberation is not a, a leisurely activity, but it's actually a servile or, or practical activity. It's ordered towards an action. Um, and that's an important, very important activity, but it's different from contemplation. Contemplation is another kind of activity. Contemplation it can be easy. It can be simply beholding something. That's usually a word, that's a word that's usually associated with contemplation. Beholding. If you've ever listened to beautiful music, or if you've stopped and looked at beautiful art, uh, that's contemplation. I like to use uh, as, a, as an example to help you understand this, to think about two different people going to a museum. Uh, say, say two people go to the Louvre in Paris and they come to the Mona Lisa. One person goes there and says, wow, there's the Mona Lisa. I'm going to get a picture of it. And they say, wow, they can, they can say, I've seen the Mona Lisa now. And they can cross that off their bucket list. That doesn't quite uh, meet uh, the demands of contemplation. Contrast that with someone else who comes to the Mona Lisa and stops and looks at it and really takes it in and appreciates its beauty. That's someone who is engaging in the activity of contemplation. Contemplation is an activity that can be enhanced, enhanced by preliminary labor. You do some reading up on something beforehand uh, to put yourself in a position to really appreciate something. But then there is that activity and that moment where you stop and you contemplate and you simply allow that, that thing of beauty, that thing of truth to inform your mind. I like to classify kind of three types of contemplation. Um, one is uh, contemplation of physical beauty. So when you go to a concert and listen to beautiful music at a concert, that's a contemplative activity. You sit there, you quietly receive and listen and attend to the beautiful thing that's put out in front of you. Um, if you go to a museum of fine arts and look at paintings or sculptures and simply enjoy them uh, and allow them to allow their goodness to come into you. Uh, that's a contemplative activity. The second one is intellectual truth. This is the, what the philosophers of the, uh, in the ancient world were after. Uh, I think that this is what the astronomers today uh, who are trying to figure out the ultimate story of the universe are really after. They're after an intellectual truth. It's not a physical beauty, it's not a, a painting, but it's an understanding of the deepest truths that uh, undergird our reality. Aristotle said that the, the human mind is the highest thing that we have. It's the highest part in us. And there's lots of things we can think about. But when we take the highest part in us and think about the highest things in the universe, we become like them. He goes so far as that it's the closest we come to becoming godlike when we're thinking about divine things. So in that regard, there's an intellectual contemplation where you may, in, may involve a great deal of work uh, beforehand, but at the end, the grasp or whatever you would understand, simply having that understanding and looking at it 
uh, you would have a God's eye view of things and it would be self-justifying, it would have intrinsic worth and it would be an activity that would be intrinsically satisfying. Finally, I think we should talk about spiritual contemplation. So here we are at a Benedictine college uh, and the Benedictines have a motto, it's called Ora et Labora. That means prayer and work. The Benedictine life is marked by work. They do work. They have a work. They, they, they do productive things. Uh, different monasteries do different things. Some do berries, some do cheeses, some do beer. Um, the monks here at St. Anselm College do the work of education. In the monastery, the, the monks have to clean their the rooms, they, they, they are assigned tasks. Uh, that's part of the way of life because they're human beings. But also because they're human beings, they set time aside for prayer. Aura. Um, and that's contemplative prayer. Benedict made a conscious decision in his rule. He said, if we're going to lead a good and worthy life, we're going to make time for prayer where we stop our work we stop the things that may be pressing, and we give time, not to just thinking about intellectual truths or contemplating physical beauty, but to actually encounter a personal God. Christian contemplative prayer is a meeting of a meeting between the human being and God in a conversation between friends. The Catechism of the Catholic Church quotes Saint. Teresa of Avila, a famous Spanish mystic, in her definition of contemplative prayer, she says, Contemplative prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. So just as we make time to spend time with our friends or our family, and we talk, and we share ourselves with our family, and we let them share themselves with us. In contemplative prayer, Christian prayer, um, human beings in their prayer life go and offer their interior life, their thoughts, their prayers, their joys, their sufferings uh, to God. And they also make a place, they make room in their souls to receive God, and they meditate on the Bible. They meditate on the teachings uh, that Christ gave. Uh, Christian contemplative prayer is marked by expressions of praise at the goodness of God and expressions of gratitude for the things that he's done for us. In the Gospel of Luke, we read about the story of Martha and Mary. Uh, Mar Mary sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. And that story has inspired the Western tradition to recognize the primacy of contempl the contemplative life over the servile life. Yep, there's always going to be busy things, things that are going to need, that are going to need our attention, but there's always a, a need to make time for the beautiful and the true, our friends, and our family, not because they're useful, but because they're good. And then ultimately, for the eternal and the true and, our, and the friendship that we can have with God.